welcome for our lecture for week 13. Wow, the semester's just flown by and we've only got a couple of weeks left, but I'm really happy that you're with us today and we'll move along quickly because I know you're busy and we'll learn as much as we can as quickly as we can. Let's go over to our study guide for week 13 that you find by going through your all-in-one schedule. As we scroll down, you'll see that as usual, there's key facts for each of these different categories that are within your chapter to learn. And there are some that are in blue that might be good to especially look out for, like here's one, shaking tent right. I wonder what that is. So when you read your text for this week, be sure to look for that. Here we have some information about a video you'll watch called The Primal Mind. It's a very interesting film. And primal means first or original. So the primal mind means traditional view of reality or how we know what's real. Very interesting information. Um, one of the things that we ask you to take notes on the film using these different categories. So what is the idea of the traditional view of Native Americans regarding time? And then what is the Euro Anglo kind of idea of time because they're different for each of these different categories. Great. So now we're going to go over to our PowerPoint for this week. And here we go to the top. The Innu um, you formerly were known uh, by some French names, one of them being Montagnacas, and I know I'm saying that incorrectly. <laughs> Uh, Inu is a lot easier to say. <laughs> so that's the, the tribe or native people that we're learning about this week. We already looked at the study guide. And here on a map, it shows uh, where these people are located, very far to the north of Canada. If you were to see Alaska, it's over here, and it actually moves down this way a little bit. So it's pretty far north, and it's very cold in the winter. And there's lots of seaways that are near these people. Inu and Inuit look similar as far as the words go, but they're actually not the same words, not the same tribe. Of course, their word for themselves is Inu, means the people. So as we found it with many other tribes, people would follow the food. So if the animals were migrating north or south. If there were particular times that fish such as salmon would be coming up the rivers, all that dictates where people live and what they're doing in different seasons. This is common, as it says in blue here, <laughs> for almost all the Native American tribes. People nowadays don't wander back and forth as much, but during the hunting season, a lot of times uh, people, especially the men, will go and hunt and be out there uh, trapping and killing animals and bringing back the meat for some period of weeks, at least during the fall. Traditionally, um, the youth would have sexual experiences before they were married. Once the um, Catholic priests came in, then they taught, no, you shouldn't have sexual experiences before you're married, only within marriage. People would marry their cross cousins. So a cross cousin sounds kind of complicated. There's parallel cousins and cross cousins. And if you've had anthropology too, cultural anthropology, you probably learned about this. But a cultural, a cross, co co sorry, a cross cousin is when you marry your mother's brother's daughter or your father's sister's daughter. So you might think about that in your own family. Who would that mean that you were marrying? A first cousin. And the reason that cultures generally decided you could marry no cousins, first cousins, which is 
pretty much the practice in the United States at this point. First cousins usually no. It depends on the state. Um, second cousins, people do marry their second cousins sometimes. But what the other two choices that cultures would generally choose at some point in the past, a cross cousin marriage or a parallel cousin marriage. And the only reason that they would allow those two is usually there weren't enough people to say that you couldn't marry a cousin at all because they had a limited population. So another very common trait you've been learning about with so many different uh, Native American nations is that the chief wasn't like the boss or the president. I am making all the decisions. Everyone's going to do what I say. No, uh, it was much more common for people to um, consult, collaborate, seek to develop a consensus. And if you were a leader, the reason you were a leader is because you've developed influence. People have listened to you because you've had wisdom, you've been around a long time, you're usually right. And maybe you're able to bring all the different points to, of view together for a unified decision. And people would respect that and they would listen to you. The Innu felt that anger would make you sick and they're not the only um, culture or even religion that believes that many, many say, well, if you're, if you're angry, it'll make your liver sick or it'll make other parts of you sick. And of course, in today's medicine, we know that anger can cause stress, uh, depending on how it's expressed or, or what you do with it. So for them, they thought it's better to try to avoid being angry or for avoid, avoid being angry for very long to keep yourself from getting sick. You could marry more than one woman. Um, usually there were more women than men. So because of that, if the women would, if several women, usually their sisters or cousins, wouldn't marry the same man, then they would have no man. <laughs> and um, we have a quote here from uh, one of the uh, Catholic missionaries I have been preaching among them that a man should not have more than one wife. I have not been well received by the women, for since there are they are more numerous than the men, if only if a man can only marry one of them, the others will have to suffer. Therefore, this doctrine is not to their liking. So you if you didn't have a husband, then not only did you not have the emotional support, but you might not have the physical protection and physical support of a man. And uh, at that time, all of those things were important. And so um, that's why they resisted this idea. The reason that there were more women than men is because men were out doing very dangerous things, you know, trying to kill a seal, for example, in ice with in very cold water. You could slip in, you could die, or you could be eaten by a polar bear, or lots of other things could happen to you and did happen to people. So that's why there were so many more women than men. When the Christian missionaries um, first came, mostly Catholic uh, uh, French priests, uh, the, some people thought, well, if I become a Christian, then maybe I won't get sick because the priests seem to be pretty healthy. And they must be healthy because they have spiritual power. Um, so eventually, there were divisions within the, that native nation between those who had become Christians and those who had not become Christians. Traditionally, they believed that all living creatures, as well as inanimate objects, an inanimate object might be a, a rock, um, something else that did not move and live, or, and the way we normally think of it, that they all had souls. And that those souls appeared as shadows or dark dark images. After death, then we all proceed, all the different kinds of souls, along the Milky Way to a large village very far away where the sun sets. And in this village, it's like life on earth, except that day and night are reversed. So I, in the, when we were looking at the study guide, I said something about the shaking tent right. So a shaman 
which sometimes people call a medicine man or a medicine woman or a spiritual practitioner or a priest, could foretell the future, locate animals, communicate with absent families by holding the shaking tent right. It was always held at night with the tent totally darkened. People were present and seated in the tent before the shaman entered. As soon as he or she did so, the tent began to shake, the tent poles bending and flattening all around them. Pretty exciting. So you might, again, a blue uh, font here about a hint. <laughs> Although people believed in sharing, they also believed the, in the idea of private ownership. Okay, so the they did believe it was okay to have some uh, private ownership, particularly hunting rights to certain areas for each family. Today, there are schools where the kids are learning their culture and they're learning to communicate in their own language, which is great. Now we're going to be going to see the story about the legend of the Northern Lights, which of course the Innu had Northern Lights, but this is not actually an Innu uh, story or myth because after looking for quite some time, I could not find an Innu story online. And it might be because it could be in French and that maybe the US Google is not showing me those stories. So if you find uh, one of their stories in English, and you send me an email with a link, you could get some extra points and I'll share it with the rest of the class. All right, here we go to our story. It is said that not long after their creation, the salmon lost their way. Aimlessly they swam in the rivers and waters of Alaska, but in their wanderings they found neither home nor rest. Then one day, a legendary being appeared to them at the base of the great mountain, a beast of unspeakable wisdom and healing, the white bear. The bear came to the edge of the waters and called to the salmon, Look to the light and swim to the top of the great mountain. There you will find your home. There you will swim in the eternal river of the sky. The smallest of the salmon peeked up out of the water and spoke to the bear. How can we swim upstream? It is against our nature. We do not have the strength. If you look upward and fight onward, replied the bear, you can conquer the great mountain. And so it was that those who chose to follow the bear began the long journey to the summit of the great mountain. Swimming upstream was tiring and painful. Some of the salmon turned back. Those who remained began to feel discouraged. Look to the heavens, reminded one of the salmon. The other salmon looked up. High above them was the night sky, filled with numberless, glittering stars. Despite the darkness of the hour, the light from these stars reminded the salmon of the bear's promise. With renewed energy, the salmon fought to swim upstream. As they moved forward, the salmon discovered that they were being filled with a beautiful new light changing colors from silvers and grays to magnificent greens and reds. After a long time of difficult swimming, the salmon made it to the very top of the great mountain, and as they peeked out from the water to look upon the stars, they found, to their astonishment and joy, that they could touch the night sky. It was not an endless expanse of air as they had assumed, but an endless expanse of water. It was an eternal river. Mm -hmm. 
These former wanderers wanted more than anything to swim in that water, to live among the stars, but something inside of them held them back. They looked down the mountain to the valley below and distantly saw the other salmon lost in the darkness below. What about them? They wondered aloud. As they said this, the white bear once again appeared before them. He told them that in order for the salmon to help those who were struggling below, they must swim in the eternal river and become a light for those who were wandering in darkness. Knowing what they truly wanted, the salmon let go of all their doubts and fears and dove into the night sky. Then, they who had become so full of life and light themselves became the Northern Lights, a river of light to guide the way for others who wander in darkness. Okay, so thank you for joining us today. I look forward to seeing you online. Have a good week.